happy Flash Fic February. How's everybody doing in chat? Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Folks who uh, participated in hashtag Flash Fic Feb last year and those who are completing the challenge this year, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, hey, hey, D&D D D D Duet, go grab your coffee uh, and then join us around the, the circle, the story circle. Um, okay, so for folks who are like, what is, what's going on? Who's this person? Uh, what is Flash Fic February? I am Lisa Penrose. I am the brand manager over at Dungeon Masters Guild, uh, which is a fifth edition D&D marketplace that is part of the One Bookshelf Marketplace family. Um, but a lot of folks don't realize we also have an awesome marketplace for a digital uh, fiction titles called Drive Through Fiction. Uh, there's also, I recently learned, nonfiction titles and cool like tarot card titles as well, a personal interest of mine. Um, so yeah, drivethroughfiction.com if you want to check that out. Uh, but right now, uh, it is February, and we are working with a group called Storytelling Collective uh, to sponsor their Flash Fic Feb uh, challenge, I guess you would call it, a challenge, uh, where every day folks uh, get prompts to write small pieces of fiction, less than 500 words, pieces of fiction. Um, and uh, at the end of this month, uh, I believe they're going to be collecting that into an amazing anthology. But last year was their first anthology of this type uh, from stories from February 2020 uh, called Flashbang. Um, so uh, let me start off by just reading you the introduction to Flashbang so you can get an idea of what it's all about. Um, and this is written by the editor Ashley Warren, aka Scribe Mind Studio, who is the head of Storytelling Collective, uh, an awesome tour de force in the tabletop role playing game community. All right, so Ashley says, the stories you're about to read were written by authors who participated in a daily writing challenge called Flash Fiction February. Authors were given a daily prompt and encouraged to write whatever they felt inspired to write as long as their stories were no longer than 500 words. It's amazing how a simple limitation can, in fact, unlock immense creativity. Although each story and voice is unique, they share beautiful prose and thought-provoking ideas that I know will stick with you long after you've finished reading them. We hope you enjoy our collection. Um, oh, what, what is Randall saying in a chat? Hey, uh, yeah, Lisa, but who's that big eyed boy on the shelf back there? What? Oh, right here. This this guy? This is a little Lucas the spider. And he's wearing uh, my wedding tiara. Because Lucas, uh, our Lucas is fancy. Why not be fancy? I mean, I should be wearing the wedding tiara all the time. We'll be slightly less fancy. We'll let Lucas enjoy his his time in, in that bit of spotlight. Um, but OK, so I've done a lot of story times on my personal stream, but this is the first one for One Bookshelf and Drive Through Fiction. Uh, and the stories I've read have been like Choose Your Own Adventure books from TSR's D&D days. And um, uh, I also read a book about how plants can read your mind. Uh, and so those are longer pieces of fiction. Uh, so this is my first time reading flash fiction. So we're going to see how it goes. If anyone has requests from Flashbang, um, the table of contents lists everybody, uh, lists the authors. So if you have a request from one of the authors, and I'll put the um, a link where you can see the list, feel free to request a story. Otherwise, I thought what would be fun is Flashbang is approximately 100 pages. It's 93 pages, um, but it, that includes like the cover and the table of contents, but almost 100. So I have D100 with me. Um, I know you're all like TTRPG nerds uh, joining me. I say that with the most affection. So let me see if I can get my pretty dice to show up. That's what we're rolling. Um, and so I thought it could be fun to roll and then just pick the story that that lands on. Um, so unless folks have requests, I'm going to we're going to do a roll here. 75. 75. That is Leaf Brownlee, uh, which story starting on page 73. So the nice thing about having a digital PDF is I can just type in the page and it jumps right to it. Um, so we're going to start with Leaf's story. Is everybody ready for some story time? Tell me what you're doing. If you're you're chilling with a cozy beverage, if you're working and listening, I'm curious. And in the meantime, I shall read Hunger by Leif Brownlee. Leif, maybe? I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. 
Um, all right, here we go. Right now, I have an insatiable hunger. I can eat a three-course meal and still go back to the buffet with a few more plates and eat my partner's dessert. There is an empty pit in my stomach that simply craves being filled. The moment it digests even a single atom of its contents, it cries out in agony until I stuff more inside it. I spend all day eating and eating and eating like I'm 11 again, discovering myself for the first time. But right now, the food is only halfway there. I'm eating the illusion of food. I bite at the air until my cheeks are full and I swallow it down, but my body knows it's not real. I get the satisfaction of eating, the mastication fools my brain, and frankly, I feel full. Yet I'm not. With each extra bite, my heart aches more, as deep down I know that I won't see real food again for months. I won't be able to satiate this unending hunger because my food is in another country. Sat on the peak, surrounded by a small circular grouping of pine trees, was a log cabin. Oh, are these all like different little? Nope. Okay, well, let's, let's see. I'm wondering if these are different little b bits of flash fiction or if they're all part of the same story. Um, okay, because my food is in another country. Sat on the peak, surrounded by a small circular grouping of pine trees, was a log cabin. It was uneven, abstract, and falling apart. Some logs were stripped and some still sitting cozily in their untouched bark, but they all knew their place and they were all respected. Each day, the owner, an elderly man with a spring in his step, would walk around the house, touching each and every log. It was more than just a touch. He would place his palm on the log and hold it there for a second or two, feeling the unique textures of his children. During the winter months, it became harder for the man to leave the cabin and spread his warmth to the cabin's bones. His bones ached and groaned, and occasionally even refused to move at all, but the man was adamant. He would drag himself across the stone floor with his arms as it, uh, if it came to it. He was willing to lose limbs to frostbite. He was willing to give his life. This fragile cabin was all that he had left, and he didn't want to ever forget its memories." story. The fisherman sat in his fisherman's chair with his fisherman's hat tipped over his eyes. His chair was stationed at the end of the dock he'd built over 20 years ago with plans to spend his summer nights there away from the world. This was the first time that the fisherman had sat here. I suppose instead of calling him the fisherman, it would be more appropriate to call him the fishing man as this was his first time. In the fishing man's house, stationed by the lake, was a cupboard dedicated to chairs, hats, vests, rods, and a varied and eclectic collection of hooks. This was the fishing man's fishing cupboard, his comfort zone. Each day, the fishing man's wife would see him leaving his fishing cupboard and ask, Do you plan on fishing today? To which the man would smile, I can fish when I'm alone. The fishing man would whisper while he held his wife in a comforting embrace, the line began to twitch and tug, but the fishing man didn't notice. He had been waiting all day in his fisherman's chair on his hand-built dock, waiting for this one fish. The line snapped as the fish broke free, and the fishing man woke up in a jolt, tears still in his eyes. Oh! Oh! That last story! Okay, so these did seem like three separate stories um, by this author. That one... Oh my gosh, that one, less than 500 words. And I mean, there's so many things I loved about that last little story in particular. Um, the uh, like the repetition, repetition of fisherman, fishing man over and over and over again. There was something really pleasing about that. Um, the transition from the fisherman to the fishing man when he dreams about his wife and that lovely little I think you don't realize at first that that's what that transition stands for and that lovely little moment between him and his wife. Um, and then as he jolts awake, the, the reader sort of like abruptly realizes what's going on and it, it just punches you in the gut with emotion. Wow. Wow. Okay. We're already getting feels. We're not even 10 minutes into this stream. Um, and that was so, so evocative. I, I loved that. 
Yes, Ashley. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Ashley Scribe Mind in chat says it's amazing how much story can be told in relatively few words. Okay, we're going to go back to the table of contents. Boop, boop. And we're going to roll another D100. Ooh, I got my vampire skull. What does that mean? It's a zero. The vampire skull is a zero. Um, so I believe that means we're page 80, which uh, Sadie Lowry's uh, stories that begin on page 76. Ba, 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 page 76. Excited to read. So I think these might be... Oh, okay. So Sadie Lowry has like a whole section. Um, uh, there are a few stories by her, um, but the one that start that includes page 80 is called Storm Chaser. That begins on page 79. So we shall read Storm Chaser by Sadie Lowry. Ferris. Her voice shrieked above the thunder. What isn't drowned in the sound is swept away by the rain. Her bare feet slip on the mud, the muck splattering across the bottom of her dress, only to be beaten out by the torrent. White hair clings to her skin. Everything around him whips. Swept hair, gray scarf, trailing blue magic churned into a torrent. Sheaths of the storm batter her alongside him. Ferris, she screams, pressing up against the cliff face and peering at where he stands above. Lightning splits the heavens around him in white, blinding fury. He turns to her, his eye lost in blue, shadowed, lost in blue, shadowed and illuminated in every crack of light across the sky. I'm all right, he calls. Isra sucks in breath and starts to climb, trembling hands struggling to grip the slicked rock. Come down. This is where the rift is weakest. Ferris. I can feel her. A stray bolt tears down through the churning clouds with a ferocity that quakes the cliff. Her heart pounds and it is always so mortal when fear and thunder rack her chest asunder. Seething bolts stray over the rock face too close to him and Isra bites back a, a scream. Please, she whisks herself up a platform and feels the countering pain and exhaustion as punishment. She's so tired. This is dangerous. Not hers, Ferris' eyes turn up again. He doesn't see her struggling to climb. This is just her, Isra. It could never hurt me. He cups his mouth, calling into the heaven's fury. I'm listening. Ferris, I hear you in the weeping storms. Lightning cracks down toward him. Isra shoves herself up the last cliff and lunges. No time to think. She sees the lightning arcing for him, and they collide. She feels heat. Blinding, tearing, desperate heat. Ripping from her muddy feet through his tight arms around her until neither of them can do anything but scream. Their eyes are lost to the storm. Two bodies collapse, rain pattering over the fallen forms until the smaller stirs, a flinch, a shift. Pain shrieks in every limb, but Isra crawls to him, choking on the air tainted with smoke and fury. Under her hand, he jerks awake, pale blue eyes snapping open and finding her. Bloody fingers find her hand, grip it, bring it to his face. I'm sorry, he starts. I felt her. He chokes. Relief seems to drive the tears from his eyes. You heard her? She's furious. You did. Isra. Ferris's voice is thick, swallowed by sobs as he sits himself up. He pulls her against him, and Isra buries him into her shoulder, stroking his hair. She was calling you. There is no pain in Isra's now as she cradles him. Only wonder. I hear you, he calls to the heavens, rasping, weak, and I won't stop looking. I will seek you in the storms. Peace, Ferris, Isra croaks, stroking his hair. He shivers, finally slumping, both of them small in the torrent. She knows. She knows. Wow. What did you all think of that story by Sadie? 
I feel like CD really captured this the idea of this like chaotic storm and really frightening thunder and lightning so close uh, very well um, in uh, in so few words. And I also really like the idea and I think it's part of the stories being so short, being flash fiction, that you don't have a lot of time to t- or a lot of words rather to tell do world building by telling people you kind of have to like slowly show and reveal um at least in the stories we've read so far uh and um uh that was uh, that was really lovely to kind of slowly discover what is exactly going on in this very chaotic scene didn't know that i was going to be doing a little bit of commentary after each story but there you go (laughs) oh okay 89 so we're gonna go to page 89 see what we got here oh this is the beginning of a story uh our first time rolling uh precisely um and this story is called underground by simon um kudajar kudajar again i'm sorry for if i'm mispronouncing anybody's name uh but underground by simon charlene sat down and began to cry It wasn't meant to turn turn out like this. Today was meant to be a special day. She was on a school trip to visit the nearby underground temples. They'd just begun their descent into the lower chambers when Charlene and her friends broke away from the class to play hide and seek. Hide and seek in an ancient temple. What a story to tell. However, something had gone wrong. Charlene had rushed around blindly in an attempt to find somewhere to hide, but had somehow managed to get herself horribly lost in a crisscrossing maze of tunnels. It was cold and damp down here, and she could barely see. The walls were sticky to the touch due to some kind of moss, and the surroundings were getting more and more claustrophobic. Help, she shouted, hoping that someone would hear her. Silence. She stood up and made her way down a narrow tunnel. While she didn't remember coming down this way, any sort of progress might save her from being trapped down here. Her eyes were starting to adjust to the lack of light, and she could see that the tunnel she was in opened up into a massive cavern. Charlene was standing on a small ledge that abruptly ended, giving way to a space that seemed to descend indefinitely. There was nowhere else to go from here. It was a dead end. She could, however, make out lights in the distance. Please help me, she shouted again desperately. I'm lost. The lights seemed to be coming closer and closer, but they weren't flames or lights from an electric torch. They looked like eyes. Uh Uh-oh. Um, (laughs) a large hand reached out and grabbed Charlene, and as it lifted her up, she could see the creature more closely. It was a giant. Legend had it the giants had built the temple many millennia ago, but they were just legends. She hadn't expected giants to actually exist. She was soaring through the air. The giant was carrying her away from the ledge and into the sheer darkness. Charlene couldn't see anything now. She screamed, started to cry, flailing in an attempt to get away from the giant's grasp. She must have struck her head somehow because she blacked out and couldn't remember anything past that point. She woke up on the tiled floor of the temple museum, surrounded by her classmates and her teacher. She had been found lying face down in an empty cavern not too far from where she had broken off from the group. It was lucky that she had been found, she was told by the museum staff. Most of those tunnels had never been explored or mapped. Nobody believed her when she recounted the incident with the giant. The tunnels are too small, they said. How would he fit? You bumped your head quite hard. Maybe you were seeing things. But she knew what she had seen. Ooh, what a, um, this story leaves me wondering, like, what happened when she blacked out? Um, or what sort of fantastical things is she not remembering? And um, was this a kindly giant who just has sort of left her somewhere to be found? Um, and what is going through her head? Like, the, um, is she... Is her head filled? I mean, it sounds like her heads are not filled with doubt because she knew what she had seen. Um, But yeah, that was a lovely story. Okay, this is fun. Let's roll again. Okay, page 54. Let's see what's on that page. Boop, boop. Okay, this is a story called Travel by Heather Von Hopp, whose name is Delightful. 
Uh, that is your Heather. Your name is like super cute. I, I like it a lot. Um, Heather Von Hopp. The world was so small when you looked down upon it from the sky. Jade watched, memorized as the miniature people climbed into their miniature wagons and horseless carriages. The perspective from the airship made Jade imagine herself picking the tiny people up and placing them down to wherever she saw fit, like a giant overlord controlling those who served her. Then they would know how she felt about her parents packing her up and sending her to the countryside for the summer. The miniature world below became less fascinating as the airship continued its graceful journey across the sky. The trip would take two days, and already Jane found no Jade found no entertainment from her fellow passengers. She wandered away from the window and sat at an unoccupied table. A loud snort startled her, and she gave a little start that almost made her fall out of her chair. Turning around, she saw a man with his head propped up with one hand, with his mouth hanging open and snoring loudly. Jade smirked, stifling a giggle, then rummaged through her messenger bag for her sketchbook, pencils, and eraser. This portly gentleman with the askew eyeglasses, bushy mustache, and loud snores would be her subject for the next hour or so. Jade could draw anything to almost perfect accuracy by only studying a subject for approximately one minute. People became uncomfortable if she stared at them for a minute. It wasn't natural. Given this, she had sketchbooks full of people sleeping or turned away from their portrait. Jade preferred to capture secret moments that no one would ever request of her. A shared kiss in the rain, the deep frown of the stately businessmen, or the not-so-silent snores of a fellow passenger, or traveler, rather. A loud clanging sound rang heavily in her ears as a metallic hand thumped down on her table. The hand was bronze and full of intricate cogs and gears, eternally whirling, powered by a strange blue glowing swirl of gas and liquid. Jade had seen synthetic parts a few times in the city, but never one so polished and beautiful. Jade looked up into the face of her unexpected guest, trying not to look shocked by the sudden loud noise, not to mention the sudden appearance of this strange traveler. The traveler was a girl, maybe a couple years older than Jade. She was dressed radically in golden and white striped bloomers styled as pants, a tight blue vest over a sleeveless top that was the soft orange color of the sky when the sun set, brown military-styled boots that laced up to her knees, and a pair of engineer goggles propped on top of her head like a headband that held back her short, messy blonde hair. Brilliant! She was laughing as she tapped Jade's drawing with her mechanical fingers, as if she was purposefully drawing attention to it. Jade smiled. Her trip was about to get far more interesting. Oh, whoa, fun! Oh, what happens next, though? Oh, hey, Doug. Yeah, I, what I'm loving about this anthology as a whole, what I love about Flashbang right now is that we're getting such varied stories, um, different genres, different... I love, like, like this story feels like this grandiose, whimsical, steampunky sort of world, whereas the first stories we read were like little, little bits of... Um, everyday, like seemingly mundane life, but still just as evocative. Uh, the, um, the variety is really nice. Um, let's, I'm going to take a sip of my coffee here. Uh, but folks, let me know what you're thinking of the story so far. Do you have favorites? Um, do you have thoughts on any of the stories? I would love to, um, to, to see and read what you have to say. Rage Cage uh, Rugger in chat says, a little slice of life drawings. Yes, exactly. I can't believe who wrote this. Heather? Oh, right. Heather Von Hopp. Uh, I can't believe Heather sets us up with such a cool, interesting character. Excellent outfit description. Love me a go some gorgeous fashions. And then we don't know what happens. <laughs> Sam Surratt uh, in chat says, I like writing about the little details in a moment and enjoy hearing about that. D&D Duet says, I love the vocal variation between the stories. Yes. Scribe Mind says, so much world building in a short story. Absolutely. Especially with this one. Um, they kind of give you like a little taste that she's like in an airship, not an airplane. Um, but then kind of like out of nowhere, 
from really the from the synthetic arm as soon as that like bangs down on the table suddenly it's like just a rush of world building and the reader can sort of imagine and extrapolate a bunch of things about the world just from just a couple paragraphs of description it's so well done rage cage says that one had some great setting info with very few words needed yeah absolutely okay let's roll our d100 again 41 Boop, boop, boop. All right, 40, 41. Okay. This story. Oh, wait, what's this? Rage Cage says, I feel like the vocab was chosen very well to depict the feeling without ha having to do 500 words of just setting. Yeah, I think that's my favorite type of world building to experience that it's built through, like, they're not telling you, like, this is what the world is. And, like, like, I love Avatar, The Last Airbender, right? But they do, like, all the world building sort of in that intro. They exactly explain to you what happened. And I love kind of discovering the world as you read. There's probably really great examples of both. I don't know if I could pick one style, actually, now that I'm thinking about it more. Okay. Looks like another fisherman story here. This is called Cheers to the Sky by Davy E. Jones. I wonder if the fish will bite today asks the fisherman to the sky as he slouches against the gunwale of his dinghy. The sky is pale blue against the glittering ocean, not a wave in sight or breeze felt. With no breeze, one would think this place to be unbearable in the South Caribbean, but with winter not too distant a memory, the heat feels good to the fisherman. Who needs to fish when you have weather like this? I shall spare the fish today, but my bottle of rum, I'm sorry, old friend. The fisherman takes the top off an opaque brown bottle, raises the bottle to his lips and chugs not once, not twice, but three times. Ah, if only fishing was this satisfying even half of the time. I wonder if the fish will bite today, asks the fisherman to the sky as he slouches against the gunwale of his dinghy. Mm. This might be repetition on purpose. I think it is. Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, sorry for the pause. Uh, I wonder if the fish will bite today, asks the fisherman to the sky as he slouches against the gunwale of his dinghy. The sky is pale blue against the glittering ocean, not a wave in sight or breeze felt. With no breeze, one would think this place to be unbearable in the South Caribbean, but with winter not too distant a memory, the heat feels good to the fisherman. Um, we, who needs uh, to fish when you have weather like this? I shall spare the fish today, but my bottle of rum? I'm sorry, old friend. The fisherman takes the top off an opaque brown bottle, raises the bottle to his lips, and chugs not once, not twice, but three times. Ah, if only the fishing was this satisfying even half the time. After the fisherman's three deep swigs, he slowly but surely brings in his fishing implements. Stowing the tackle is a little more laborious as the rum is starting to kick in, but after much effort, the task is completed. Leaning back against the gunwale of the dinghy, the fisherman looks up to the sky and while cracking a leathery smile says, shh, don't tell my friends I didn't catch any fish today. Raising the rum bottle to the sky, I won't, uh, I won't tell you if you won't, after several seconds of silence, it's a deal, cheers. Making a motion like the fisherman and the sky are clinking glasses, the fisherman toasts the sky and takes three more deep swigs of the sweet amber alcohol. Settling in the dinghy with feet dangling over the opposite gunwale, arms stretched out resting against the dinghy, and a straw hat over his eyes to block the sun, the fisherman falls fast asleep. Uh, I think, actually, I don't know if um, that that repeated section was on purpose. Um, uh, so, sorry I read that a couple times. Um, but I love that this is just like a little happy, warm moment. Full of rum. <laughs> All right, we're going to do another. Ooh. I'm actually, I feel like there's some stories here that are like really, really short. They're on one page um, and uh, they're less likely to get rolled on the dice because of that. So I'm actually, I've scrolled to the next page and it's just a couple paragraphs, also by Davy Jones. And um, I am going to read that just because we might not get a chance if I'm just counting on the dice. Um, so Wanted by Davy E. Jones. A homeless man with scruffy salt and pepper hair wearing a worn out black t-shirt and pants holds out a sign that reads, Wanted, pen and paper. 
A man in a crisp navy suit and bespoke Oxford dress shoes walks by and scoffs. What are you going to do? Eat the pen and paper? The homeless man responds, no, but the words I'll write will eat you alive. What a great little evocative story. I loved the exact like sentence structure and contrast between the two men. Um, that's very, that's delightful. <laughs> Rage cage. I had a hard time keeping mine short. Uh, yeah, I like, I, I guess I would have to sit down and actually try, but I've never thought to write a story in just three paragraphs like this one. Um, I can be very verbose, uh, but I really admire people who can. Ooh, okay, we're page 11. I'm gonna type that in so we don't have to scroll. Ooh, sorry, I just saw what the last word of this story is. So, oh, okay, all right, that makes sense. What, Rage Cage says, some folks who did it last year were doing like two to three sentence stories. Well done, that's its own like type of craft in itself. Well done to, to folks who can do that. Okay. This story, which begins on page nine, is called Voicemail by A.K. Ballou. Beep. You have one new message and 12 saved messages. New message. Your heart is a muscle the size of your fist. Your stomach is an expandable organ that is also the size of your fist. Your kidney is the size of tiny baby fists. Fists are a weird metric to use for body parts. For one thing, everybody has a different size of fist. Some people have long, skinny fingers that curl up real tight. Others have thick sausage fingers that clench into a ball almost as big as my whole head. Plenty of people's fists fall in between the two. I was meant to be talking about hearts. Your heart, specifically. Not sure how I ended up actually talking about fists. Well, I, I do know, but rehashing it will probably send me down the rabbit trail again. For some strange reason, you've trusted me with your heart, which is terrifying, as I'm generally not trusted with anyone's pet, let alone a baby or a vital organ. Well, metaphorically trusted. With a metaphorical organ. Human culture is weird like that, assigning emotions to body parts. Most of the emotions seem to live in a lot of places. Fear in the stomach, in your palms, the back of your neck, sending bumps along your skin. Anger also lives in the fists, but mostly on your faces, where many emotions display themselves. Happiness, surprisingly, seems to live in your feet more than anywhere else. I say this is surprising because happiness seems the most bubbly, anti-gravity emotion, yet lives the closest to the ground. I got sidetracked, didn't I? Always doing that. You always say that's why you like me, but I doubt that. Most simply find it irritating and wish that I would get to the point, which is in this case your heart, metaphorically. Metaphors are tricky. No matter how good the metaphor is, eventually it breaks down, ceases to hold water, as it were. As if the metaphor were a kind of bucket, except now I've muddied the metaphorical metaphor waters. Yeah, I'm not sure what I'm doing anymore either. Is this what nervous feels like? Does it flutter in your stomach, race through your hair, make everything you see clearer? Is it nervous that I feel in the pounding of my heart? Or is that love? I, f I think it might be love. You said it so easily. It just slipped out. Your head nestled under my chin as you watched the galaxy go by last night. You were so flustered as you assured me I didn't have to say it back because you know, you know human emotions and concepts are so often beyond me. But I don't think this one is because what I've been trying to say this whole time is I love you too. Beep. This one was so, so fun. Yes, Sam Surratt in chat, you said it exactly. That was a nice wandering path. I love that it was like felt very stream of consciousness, but also you can tell was like the the words like flowed so well, so nicely that there it's a deliberate stream of consciousness that I really enjoyed because it captured that sort of fluttery nervous feeling um, when you're you're trying to get to, to something um, as important as saying I love you for the first time and oh I feel like I'm rambling now that was I just really loved this this one gave me a really fuzzy feeling inside D&D &D duet says daw in the chat yeah exactly precisely <laughs> Ooh, 
we just got our first repeat, um, a 10 on the D100 or the percentile die and a skull, which is a zero. Although, wait, wait, or is that 100? I mean, there aren't 100 pages, so I have to reroll anyway. Wait, how do you get a... How do you get just a 10? Oh, no, wait, I think double zeros is the 100. Okay. That was a 10, which... Ooh, oh, no. Hold on, my die fell. Okay, we're back. We re-roll. Oh, yeah. Saying I love you nerves plus leaving someone a voicemail nerves. For real. All right. We rolled a 41, which is also one we've gotten already. 55. No, nope, that's the awesome steampunky story. 18. Okay, 18. I don't think we were anywhere near 18. Ooh, it brings us right to the start of a story called Sable's Oath by Azra Hawthorne. Ooh, there's going to be a name that I don't know how to pronounce. Okay, in advance, if I mispronounce words, be nice about it. No one bully me. I am a Cancer Moon. I will cry on stream. Okay. Sable's Oath by Azra Hawthorne. I am beholden to no person, for I am bound only by my oath to the stars. I was born under the constellation Ophiuchus, and that alone. That, pos that thought passed through my head again. Curse those stars, I whispered, hoping not to be heard as I hid in the ramshackle remains of what was once probably an elegant building. Holding my breath for a second longer than was probably needed to steady myself. I had to get back, but with all these undead crawling around, literally, it was not going to be easy. I darted across the street from ruined building to building, working my way toward the alley I needed to get to for the rendezvous. And that's, when and that's where everything went wrong. So very wrong. I swear I'm cursed. A stray cat, startled by my presence, hissed at me, darted down an alley, and in the process knocked over a precarious set of broken down boxes, which of course led to the loud collapse of the building next to it. That's when they saw me. All of them. Cold, dead husks just staring at me for a second. So I did the only thing that made sense. I ran. Faster than I think I'd ever run in my life. The horde of undead followed behind me like a rolling wave of rot and decay, howling in its incessant hunger. I kept running till I could run no more, and that's when I turned and faced the monsters before me, calling out for the meal they expected, Ma's drooling. Well, they wouldn't be getting one. I rolled up my sleeve, revealing the coiled serpent mark on my left arm and began the chat, the chant. Saron, the breath of life throwing through me like a raging fire, and see my enemies burn to naught but ash and scorched ground. A gout of blue fire erupted from my hand and blasted the mass before me. Most of the horde turned to ash, and the rest seemed to disperse. I breathed a sigh of relief, only a little too soon. Out of the ground erupted a creature of nightmare, made of flesh woven together with clockwork almost seamlessly. Sable Machinist, the creature hissed. Well, shit, the person cursed. Look, whatever you're selling, I don't have time for, so if you would kindly... Your head is wanted. The creature jerked its head sideways and cackled. Tell me something I don't know. The small figure leaned back their head, their, leaned back their head, hood falling down, revealing a mane of sable black hair with tawny skin and a couple of scars across one cheek. Minson, could you take care of this for me? I have places to be, people to see. The mark on the person's arm glowed again, and from around the corner, a six-foot metallic automaton of clockwork gears brandishing sword and shield appeared. As you wish, sir. The automaton said, stepping forward in front of the much smaller figure. Thanks. Bye now. The small figure darted behind the building, glancing back to see the fighting start and hear the grate of metal on metal. Ooh, this was a really different type of story. Like, very pulp action, um, but in a, a sort of fantasy world. That was a fun change of pace. I'm loving the different, uh, just the different things that, 
different genres uh, and voices that the authors have. Okay, we rolled an 81 next. I, that feels like it's kind of in the danger zone of repeating. So let's see. Yeah, that is Sadie's story. 33. That should be a new one. Ooh, okay. This one is called Space by Christopher Harding. It was here, it was there, it was everywhere, stretching on as far as the eye could see and beyond. Call it what you want, the void, the abyss, I don't care. All around me was this perpetual darkness enveloping my being. I called out, but to no response. My voice was hoarse, my throat was sore. Could nobody hear me? Was my struggle all in vain? I reached out into the black, trying to grasp at whatever I could, my hands passing through the still air, making no purchase. As I looked down, there was nothing. I was suspended in this unfathomable pit, unable to tell what direction I was facing. The scale of the abyss was terrifying. Something could be racing towards me, and I would have nary an idea of my impending doom. I reached out, yet could not see my hands. Was I even awake? Were my eyes open? Maybe this was some horrible dream that I couldn't wake up from, a never-ending nightmare of isolation and nothingness. The more I dwelled on the idea, the more I thought about what this place was, the faster my heart began to beat. Panic set in. What if this wasn't a dream and I'm being punished? Could this be my own personal hell? I began to sweat. The coldness of this space suddenly hit me. Now I was shivering, my heart racing. Nothing was helping. I was trying to calm my breathing down and think relaxing thoughts, yet it was all for nothing. Suddenly I felt a presence for what seemed like the first time in my life, and it was familiar. This thing emitted an aura that ebbed and flowed with my breathing. The depths closed in. This inescapable void felt much smaller than before. I struggled to move while the black engulfed me, suffocating, choking, smothering. I called out once more, and I heard an echo. Or was it a reply? A soft voice called out to me. It's okay. I'm here for you. I've got you. Just breathe. One two, three, four, five, and out, two, three, four, five. Follow along, and you'll be okay. I'm here for you. I listened and controlled my breathing, just as the voice said. As I calmed down, the darkness began to ease. It turned from black to gray to white. The shining brightness faded away, and my vision became clear. I was lying on the floor, clutching at my chest and crying, surrounded by familiar faces. I heard that soft voice again and felt their arms cradle me. I looked up and saw my best friend in the world smiling down at me. I heard my vo own voice whisper, you saved me from that place. Thank you. Wow. So th th this... Um, like they call it space. They sort of, Christopher sort of sets up what your expectations might be. And it does really feel like the void of space. And I think the more, um, he starts to speak of panic and nerves and feeling stuck here, the more having suffered like panic attacks and stuff myself, it sort of felt like, is that the direction maybe the story is going? I really liked that sort of slow transition, slow reveal, and the really ev evocative, in almost sort of a horrifying way at the beginning, uh, that evocative uh, storytelling to really sort of put you in that headspace a little bit. Oh, Rage Cage says, I just need to say that Lisa is reading this out so well. Some great emphasis and well-timed voice fluctuations. Well, it's easier to do when the writing is awesome, which it has been. Um, but I appreciate that. I really like reading out loud. Uh, I grew up, my stepdad and I would read to each other um, when I was little. Sound of Bones, thanks for popping in during uh, during your lunch. Blackie girl, I would love to read audiobooks. I don't know how to how to make that happen. Okay, 83. This might be a story we've read already. Oh, no, this is another Sadie Lowry story. Oh, 
it looks like it's the same, maybe the same characters or at least the same name. Okay, we're going to read this one. It's called The Lord's Waltz by Sadie Lowry. Lady of Storms. There is a stiffness in the way Ether offers his hand, a sharp angle to his elbow, not at all reminiscent of the languid way his brother moves. Her, eye dan her eyes dance in the flickering firelight. He cannot be offended because he is in trance. Creator of all, she murmurs, low and wry and familiar. She has this way about her voice. She could say Tyrius's name a hundred times and it would never match the curl of her tongue around his title. When she says Ether, he will be fully lost. Don't tease me, he murmurs. Her laugh is low. A goddess likes to be asked. Even Tyrius, no, dance with me. Hion is never still. The winds trail her, fire kindles in her spirit, passion is the sinew of her soul, but here she is still. Only the darting embers of light over her skin move, and her eyes as they course his face. Her palm slides against his. He leads her toward the ring around the fire and the turning couples that bloom around it. His steps are stiff until she tugs him closer. Then they are tenser. I've asked you to dance before, she says, low, and he groans. And you said, it is not fit, he mutters. It is not fit for the Lord of all to dance. You still tease me. Ah, but he could drink forever the way amusement alights her eyes. If it is not fit, he clears his throat, his eyes darting away from her. That is a mistake. He catches the way her dress whirls around her form, the elegance and energy of her steps, the billow of her hair in the moonlight. There is nowhere he can look that does not enchant him. It is. Knowing flashes in her eyes. It is so rare that he feels nervous. Her words upheave his stomach. Are you so changeable? He weighs a thousand words on his tongue, then sighs. Only for you. Stormy eyes, not blue, not like Ferris's, but green, like the raging sea fix on his. It is like being sundered by tempests. My lord, she begins, and he finds his chest cleaved and trembling. Do not tease me, he breathes. She weighs a thousand words of her own. Ether, soft, I have been, at, I have been waiting for you to ask. Something cracks in him, raw and dividing and new. He was wrong. He is not lost in her. He is found. Along the white marble bench, Isra plucks out a gentle tune on quiet strings, and Ether rests his forehead against hers. I'm sorry I kept you waiting. Oh, oh. <laughs> that story. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. I kind of like that we read the other story and were in introduced to Ferris and Ezra because I feel like without that context, it might be a little bit like, oh, that's a reference I don't understand. Sure, let's keep going. Um, so and I like that we're seeing those characters in the background of this story. I wonder if Sadie uh, did Flashfic February um, with uh, the same like characters or world. That's kind of a cool way to approach it. Um, a bunch of stories in the same world with the same protagonists, um, but a bunch of different flashbacks. Um, all right. I'm going to turn to 66 because uh, I'm sorry I'm going to mess this up. I don't think I've heard your last name said out loud, but... Page 66 is the story Heart by Carrie Jo Freudigman. All right. Yeah, that wasn't so bad. Freudigman. What a beautiful day for a match. The sun shines through darkening clouds that hold the threat of rain, but the pitch remains dry. I lace my boots tightly, don my jersey with a big number nine emblazoned upon my back, and slip my mouth guard into place. The first 40 minutes lapse without precipitation, but as the second half gets started, the sky breaks and the droplets plunge down with force. 
Our team has played so hard, but the trail but trail closely behind. The second half progresses in the same fashion. Each ruck is a battle, each scrum a fight for possession. Each side manages to score a try. The time is running low, but we don't have much distance to cover. Just one try separates us from the win we have worked so hard for. The referee starts the cadence. Crouch. Or sorry, I mean I said that really spooky. Crouch. The pack gets low and sets up. Bind. They tighten their form and prepare to engage. Set. The front lines interlock and I roll the ball in. As our, ho- our hooker pedals the ball to the back of the pack, I ring around, prepared to scoop it up. The opposing team makes a strong push and gains some ground, the ball tumbling back to the feet of our props. With matching vigor, our second row regains our position like workhorses, guiding a plow through the mud. The ball somersaults to the feet of the eight crouched before me. As soon as the grips on the ball grace my fingers, I pitch it back hard to our fly half. With the competition closing in, the ball swiftly makes its way down the back line until finally our winger takes off in a sprint. At this point, I've looped around to support the wing and have made chase. Only two defenders and the fullback remain between us in the try zone. The wing charges and spins through a tackle by the opposing outside center, tripping slightly as her body moves faster than her feet can carry, but then continues on. Her attempt to break the tackle of her rival wing is not so lucky, but I am there to support her and she successfully offloads the ball to my nimble hands before she goes down with her tackler. My heart races in time with my feet and my braids slap my shoulder blades in rhythm with my stride. I cut across the pitch toward the uprights. I can hear the squelching of my boots in the water-sodden soil and feel the mist of mud fling up my back. The fullback is hot on my trail, but as I near the line, I leap into the air, grasping the wet ball with my numbing fingers. I see the ball clear the line, followed by my drenched body, and then I close my eyes, bracing for impact. The ball leaves my hand as another body collides with mine, and I open my eyes just in time to see another set of fingertips between the drops of rain loosen the ball from my grip, sending it hurtling back into the air. Before I have a chance to fully comprehend what has happened, the referee blows the whistle, signaling the end of the match. For a moment, I lay still in the cold, wet grass, feeling the cold soak into my bones. I sense a presence hovering over me, our coach, with an outstretched arm. You played with heart, kid. Well done. Oh, that was such an action packed, like, um, like one little moment that probably is like a split second. I don't know sports, so maybe it's more than a split second, but it felt like a split second of like, um, but like slightly stretched out into slow motion, seeing all of these little things happening. Um, I loved that. And I really loved the last line. And I also really love that you use the word squelching. It's such like a chewy word. All right, we're going to go back to rolling some dice. Rolling some dice. We probably have time for like one or two more stories. All right. 59. Okay, this story is called The Soldier by Jake Bhattacharya. The sound of explosions and the shouts of battle reverberated around him as war charged across the snowy fields, sword in hand. The ether forged barreled into an enemy, knocking them to the ground before they went lifeless as Ward's blade met a vital organ. Around the soldier, cracks of lightning and the detonation of fireballs sounded, and hails of arrows flew overhead. He wondered, what would it be like to die? Would he experience anything? Grave came for the souls of the mortal races. That much everyone knew, but what about him? What about his people? Did his soul dwell within his metal casing? He liked to think so. Maybe things would just go black. Could he even really die? The artificers could repair most, most fallen ether forged. Maybe that meant he didn't have a soul. A sword scraped against his polished back, finding no purchase. Ward turned and regarded his assailant, raising his sword ready to strike. He faltered, seeing the young man before him. He was little more than a boy, by Ward's estimation at least. The facial structure was too soft, the skin too smooth. He was perhaps sixteen summers at most, clad in ill-fitted chainmail and holding a longsword too heavy for him to wield properly. The boy's eyes widened in fear as the gladiator towered over him, unaffected by his attack. 
The din of battle around them faded into the background, and time seemed to slow for the pair. Instinctively, Ward moved to lower the blade, but his limbs did not obey. The boy didn't pose a threat. It was plain to see. Ward wondered what had transpired for him to be here, what sort of person he was, whether he had a mother, a father, a family. What had brought him here to this spot with Ward? Where might he go after this? Perhaps he would be a merchant, a smith, or a cobbler, a painter, a musician, or a writer, a teacher. Perhaps he would fall in love or start a family. Perhaps he wouldn't. In that moment, Ward realized he needed to choose the value of that future. He decided if, if it lived or died. It did have value, he thought. Then the programming took over, and Ward lifted the boy from the ground and put him to the sword in one swift motion, powerless to interfere. The boy's por torso slid to meet the sword's cross guard, then slumped off the blade and onto the cold ground as the sword lowered. The snow around the corpse slowly grew red, like ink spilled on parchment, and blood laced his weapon. Inside his steel cranium, Ward screamed. Maybe he did have a soul. Oh, that took a turn, that story. I thought he was going to let the boy go. Oh, and like how torturous to have all of those thoughts go through your head and not be able to control your actions just the idea of this this um ether forged just screaming in his head that he's done something so horrible um that's we can't we can't end on that note <laughs> let's see if we can get an uplifting story 62 oh i'm sorry 26 26 All right. For good. Yeah, torso meeting a sword equals not a happy ending. <laughs> Reminds me of the Cyberman. Oh, yeah. Wacky girl. Like, totally. All right. Challenge of Legend by Chris Matthews. The creature strutted around the open field. He had long, thick, curved black horns jutting from his forehead and razor sharp teeth lining his smile. His broad, crimson-colored shoulders and chest were bare, and his hooved feet turned up earth wherever he paced. He flashed a smile at the slightly built younger, young woman across the field and growled. "'Shall we begin, little one?' he said, his voice a deep rumble that echoed all around them. She nodded and whispered just loud enough for the beast to hear. "'Let's see what you've got, darkness.' He roared his laughter with laughter and looked around at the terrified folk gathered around the field. Then his deep voice thundered out a steady driving rhythm that kept time with the thump of his hooved feet. There were whispers, wails, moans, and warm laughter in his words, and all around him felt themselves shiver at the touch of his voice. He finished casting his spell, gave a courtly bow, and showed his fangs again in an evil grin. Your turn, and then your soul is mine, he said, and laughed low in his throat, his eyes blazing. Jonah tightened her grip on the one weapon she hoped would be the instrument of the beast's defeat. She stepped forward, brought the lute up to the ready, and then began to play. The music lifting into the air, land joined the breeze that flowed around her blowing her hair and dress as they moved gently with the rhythm. Then she added her voice, a haunting sweet tone that eased the effect of the beast's own song. She began to play and sing faster, lifting the spirits of all with her song. With one final note, she finished her song and spun the loop back onto her pack. She looked at the devil lord as he brushed a tear from his eyes, hung his head, and then presented her with her prize, a golden lute spun just for her. I told you I'm the best there's ever been, but if you ever want another lesson, you know where to find me, she said with a smirk. With a flourish, she sketched a quick bow, turned and sauntered off towards the nearby town with a wave at her fallen opponent. Oh, that one was much uh, like a, a much brighter note. Good and light win the day. I'm loving how so many. So I imagine 
because this was run by scribe mind which is ashley who uh is such a, a figure in tabletop rpgs and dungeons and dragons specifically i feel like there's a lot a few stories in here where i can tell that like people would be into dungeons and dragons sort of like this fantasy action and spell casting the ether forged i wonder how much that was inspired by what goes through a war forge's head a very a, an intense story for such a chill dude that's funny knowing that about Chris. I did not know that. Um, but it is the top of the next hour, uh, 11 uh, uh, a.m. over here. So it's time to get back to work. But gosh, did I enjoy reading these flashbang anthology stories for you all. Um, if you there are so many more stories that I didn't read. So if you loved this anthology, the different voices, the variety of storytelling, go to drive through fiction.com. Look up flashbang um, and you will see this uh, beautiful anthology that I Ashley organized. Um, also, there are a few more days left in hashtag FlashFicFeb. Um, look up that hashtag on Twitter if you want to see folks posting about their flash fictions um, as part of this challenge, and maybe other folks are doing this challenge as well. Um, and keep an eye out for Storytelling Collective putting together a new anthology for this year's stories on Drive Through Fiction. Um, I mean, also, while you're at Drive Through Fiction, just take a look at the other stories that we have there. Um, there's so many digital titles, um, shorter pieces of fiction like this, but also um, novels and novellas as well. Um, so, so much. I found there's a lots of like spooky fiction as well on Drive Through if you're into spooky fiction. Um, I love this. This was a blast. Um, we'll have to figure out doing more story times. Um, maybe once the 2021 Flash Fig Feb uh, anthology comes out, we'll read some of those fresh, shiny stories. Um, I'll be armed with my, my D100 or whatever, whatever dice makes sense for that one. Uh, till next time, everyone, enjoy the rest of your day and your week. Uh, take care of yourselves and uh, each other. Uh, and I'll see you next month for Lunchtime with One Bookshelf. Bye, everybody.